Dude, this is such... I cannot wait for this, dude, because I, I uh, first of all, you're so good at this. Let's go inside the crafting of a brand new keynote speech in support of an entrepreneur's business and new book. Let me try this on for size. The, the looming question is, so what is the speech? What is the keynote? What gets you on the main stage? What gets you referral business? Uh, let, me, let me verbalize some of the uh, friction I'm feeling. And that's like part of the genius of the story is it opens people up to a new possibility, clears away existing head trash, and behind it, your IP can come in. Dude, that's so brilliant. That's how, that's brilliant. Yep. Hey, I'm Jay Akunzo, and I advise and executive produce entrepreneurs and experts with something meaningful to say. A lot of experts today have been commodified. Expertise is found everywhere. It's foundational, but found everywhere. That's a problem. Right now, the people who seem to command the attention of an audience are mostly full of hype. But without tipping towards their grimy tactics, what can a smart expert do to differentiate and to resonate? They can stop creating content and start creating IP. And that's what I do with my clients. And today, we're going to go inside a coaching call that I recorded and I'm sharing with their permission. This coaching call is with the great Justin Moore. Justin is a sponsorship coach for creators. He's the founder of the business Creator Wizard, which provides training, education, and other services to help you secure brand deals and sponsorships. His newsletter reaches more than 33,000 subscribers and sponsorship deals that he's coached people through in trainings and in client engagements has exceeded more than $5 million for those creators. But his audience is changing. People who wouldn't really call themselves creators have started gravitating to me and saying like, hey, I don't, I'm not dancing on TikTok, but yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> exactly, you, right? And it's like, I'm not doing that, but I feel as though sponsorships could play a role in my business. Justin's aware of that. And he's trying to juggle both the existing audience he's built and this new group that's proving very fruitful for his business. And he thinks two projects can help him bridge that gap. Number one is his book, Sponsor Magnet. As of this recording, it's coming out soon. It hasn't yet released. So he's also developing the second project, his signature speech. And that's where he turned to me, and we're gonna work through it together today. We actually build the bones of Justin's keynote speech, beat for beat, for the very first time. And we use a structure that you can take with you to develop your talks, whether you give workshops, breakouts, keynotes, or you just wanna have a stronger sense of your own IP and message ahead of some big moment in your career. So let's develop the keynote speech of the great Justin Moore. Let me tell you where my mind is right now as I, cool. you know, we're, you know, time of recording, we're basically four months before launch date. Yep. Um, and, you know, in the background, I'm thinking through all the various like launch strategy things that I'm going to be doing of like how my book fits into my overall portfolio of the business, right? Yep. For anyone listening or watching, like my, my, my courses, I mean, my, um, my business is structured primarily around uh, a signature course that I have as well as uh, ongoing coaching right, for sponsorship strategy. And um, I, have an, I have a prediction of what the book is going to do for my business, okay. which is that it's going to uh, broaden the application or the reach of uh, who my current customer base is. Right now, it's like mainly kind of like influencers, right? YouTubers, Instagrammers, TikTokers, podcasters, et cetera. But more and more over the last like three or four years, um, people who wouldn't really call themselves creators have started gravitating to me and saying like, hey, I don't, I'm not dancing on TikTok, but yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> exactly, you, right? And it's like, I'm not doing that, but I feel as though sponsorships could play a role in my business. And so I believe that, um, you know, to date, I've kind of shot fish in a barrel of like the people who have come to me where it's like I, sponsorships are like obvious to me, but like a lot of the people that I meet more and more on the interwebs and when I'm at conferences and things like that are like, they, they approach me and they're like, no, I'm, I'm never doing sponsorships, right? I have, I'm a coach or I'm like an author or I'm like, I have a conference, like all these things. And they never in a million years would be like, oh yeah, sponsorships, I should think about that. But then I have like a three minute conversation with them and like, you know what? I'm gonna like look your stuff up now or I'm gonna, I wanna talk to you, I wanna hire you. And so like, I have this prediction that like once the most approachable content format is out there, which is the book and the, you know, the cheapest and all that stuff, um, my business might look a lot different in like three to five years. And so the reason why I'm excited to talk with you today is like all the talks that I've done, I've been paid to talk and I've, I've done a lot of talks, hundreds of talks over the last couple of years. But like, um, I feel as though what my signature talk should be is the most approachable version of my, of my material. Yeah. And I just, I just don't think I have done that yet. 
Right. Uh, okay, so a couple things. One, I just interviewed Seth Godin for the show. His book, next book, This Is Strategy, comes out this October. Famously, he said, I only write a book when I absolutely have to. So I asked him, why'd you have to write this one? And he goes, people don't talk about and share in the human-to-human -human sense, not the link-sharing sense, blog posts. They talk about and share books. Like a book gets gigs. A book gets uh, into different rooms you're not a part of. A book is the way to like hand someone a better business card than you can ever create out of an actual business card. And I think a book also does convey um, status in some ways. I think there's some potential dilution. But if you can defend it and write it, if you can write a good book with a big idea at its core and you can defend it from the stage virtual or in person, if you have the book and the speech – I do think like the world is your oyster. Like you, you are able to knock in, knock down doors and get into communities in a way that having a large social following doesn't do. Um, hmm. It's about influence. It's not about followers. So you said reach and I'm like, yes, but a very specific kind of reach. The main stage of the right event is where you should be, not a breakout track where you're up against concurrent speakers yeah. and you're forced to compete. And I mm -hmm. think there's like a, a difference here. Breakouts are how to's and keynotes are how to thinks. And mm -hmm. the difference is the how to leads with the solution, but the keynote leads with the problem or paradigm shift. So mm -hmm. if I'm, I don't know, a podcast guy, um, I could do a how to make a great podcast breakout and people go, yeah, I, there's five talks at 12 o'clock and I'm going to select the one I know I want the solution for. I'm making a podcast. I'll go to that one. Mm -hmm. With the keynote, you need your like universal specific idea or premise where it's mm -hmm. like it appeals to everybody in the room but feels so personal and specific to each person mm -hmm. that it's better off if you lead with not how to make a podcast but how to go beyond grabbing attention to hold it you know like or the difference between followers and influence or whatever right like these are better podcast adjacent speeches for the main stage which oh by the way in the talk you might make the case for i think the podcast is actually the best vehicle to solve this problem or change your approach, right? But you leave okay. it there later. Does that I have, sense? I have, it does make sense. And I was thinking about this while you were talking about what it is for me in the book. And I think, let me, let me, let me try this on for size. Yeah. Um, I have one of the primary objections that I overcome in the introduction of the book is, can I just hire someone to do this for me? I think that this is like a pretty universal stuff around, especially around amongst creatives where it's like, they want to just like play with the creative stuff all day long. Yeah. They want to create, create the thing. And can't I just find someone to like pay them a percentage, pay them a cut. You go out there and pound the pavement for me and help me make the economics work to like keep the lights on. But like, I just want to, I don't want to like deal with that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I overcome that in the, in the introduction to say like, no, <laughs> You can't do that. You have to, you have to understand right. the, the economic engine behind your business. And, um, I, I make a case for that. And so like, is that the, cause I could, I could, I probably, I have a, a, an article that I've written, um, that's called 99% of creators should not hire managers. <laughs> and, and here's why. And so well, it's like, it wouldn't be it a would, while ago. Like there was a yeah. moment in time where you were deciding the theme of the book. And it was I was, like, I was actually thinking manager. about, I was thinking about writing a book called that, like fire your manager, but there was for a lot of different reasons I decided not to. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. What, what do you think of this central idea of like convincing yeah. people that they can't off, uh, like can't delegate the business stuff? So, okay. So I want to share what I think is the most transformative part of developing a speech is to imagine you're having a dialogue with the audience where you have to, you basically have to meet them where they're at, hit every beat in the conversation along the way, because they're going to be thinking about questions and objections, but you're not going to hear their side of the dialogue, right. right? So you have to pretend you're having this dialogue from the stage, virtual or in person. And as a, a domain expert, as someone immersed in this, who thinks about this all the time, you're at letter Z and they're at A. And so mm -hmm. like, Either, if that's who you are, you're just way too close to Z when you start speaking, or you're like, I know I got to meet them where they're at. And so you end up going A, B, C, elemental P, X, Y, Z. And people go, huh? Mm, what? Like, right. hold on. You, you gripped me at first, and then you leapt way too far ahead. So it's like this excruciating thing to effectively, and I'll say it this way, again, like make the lawyerly logical case for your perspective and your premise so that they get it and see what you see. And oh, by the mm. way... Now I'm hot for sponsorships, or now I need creator wizard services, or now I want to follow Justin, or now I need to go to the breakout that Justin said he's doing later today or tomorrow mm. morning after opening this whole conference to the entire room as the keynote. So rather than like 
try and come up with the idea in like one minute, I want to go through the dialogue outline and I'll play okay. the audience and you play the speaker and we'll okay. assess like how it is like basically the early bones of your speech is what we'll create. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the looming question is, so what is the speech? What is the keynote? What gets you on the main stage? What gets you referral business, both to continue speaking and to mm -hmm. hire you for products and services, right? Um, let's start the speech development process by okay. imagining this dialogue. So this is called the dialogue outline. It's equal parts IP assessment tool. Do I have all the goods needed for the speech? And if not, we got to go build and create and you know write those. And am I making the right argument and hitting all the beats I need? So they kind of smack their heads and go, of course, I couldn't see this any other way now, right? Mm. Your ideas mm -hmm. are irresistible, I need more. Um, so that's, that's carefully structured, right? So let me give you the dialogue outline in brief, and then we're gonna do a very messy process where you speak, I write, and we're gonna try to get it out on the page. You waltz up onto the stage, virtual or in person, and people go, why is this for me? Why should I care? And the first response is, well, you have this goal, right? Now, keep in mind, there's like artful, creative, arresting ways to like do all this stuff. We're not talking about performance yet. We're just talking about the beats of the talk. So the first is, how will this help me? And you respond with the goal they have, which is not, you know how you want to be better with sponsorships, right? It's something else relating to mm -hmm. sponsorship, but it's what are they already aware of? And you think that your approach to sponsorship or sponsorship overall is the better solution for that they're not considering, but you can't reveal that yet. So the okay. first question, and you know, I'll go through all the beats first, but the first question, how will this help me? Here's your shared goal. You know how you want this? Yes, same page. And then they ask, aren't I already trying to achieve that? And you're like, yes, you are. Here's the status quo approach. Here's what you're going through. And then they go, yeah. So why not continue doing it that way? That's the third question. And then you address the problems with the status quo. Here's your shared goal. Here's how you're coming at it. Here's the problems with the status quo. And then they go, oh my God, I didn't see that. Thank you for mm, like lifting mm, a veil. Mm, or they nudge mm. their friend, you know, in the crowd. And they're like, Justin really gets our reality. Was he in like, was he in our last coffee meeting where we like were complaining about this shit? Like he gets it, right? And the follow on question is, so if you have my best interests, you do. I'm doing it a certain way. You revealed problems in that certain way, and I see it now. What else can I try? And into that goes your premise, right? The big shift you're trying to make. You know, for me, it's like you should stop caring about reach and prioritize resonance above all else. Don't be the best. Be their favorite. Because when you do things that matter more to people, you don't need to market as much. You can hustle for attention less. I want you to make that simple switch, right? Mm. So what is that central switch that is the crux of the talk. And it's really what the talk is about, but you got to lead people to it. And then they go, okay, I think I get it. What does this even look like? And you're like, let me tell you the story of Sam, right? And you mm. give a lead story, an illustrative story, not about you, about a person who, by the way, maybe hired you, maybe didn't, maybe took your course, maybe didn't. That's beside the point, but it's a journey the person goes on where they had the same goal, where they came at it the status quo way, where they encountered those same problems, where they made the mental switch to do it or see it differently, and then what followed and what we can learn. And after the signature story, people go, okay, so Justin, this is incredible. I see you have my best interests in mind. I see that the way I'm doing it has some problems. I understand this change you're asking me to make and what it looks like. And the only remaining question is like where most of us as experts and teachers live all the time is like, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, here's the methodology. And that's where it's mm -hmm. much more like, super book adjacent material, mm -hmm. right? Because you're like, here are the steps. Here's the two by two mm -hmm. matrix. Here's the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the method is. What If you have a signature framework, you might have some supporting stories mm -hmm. and examples along the way. Mm -hmm. But the dialogue mm -hmm. basically runs from where they're at to where you want them to be. But I have to order it the right way to sort of move them from their status quo to what I think they should be doing. And at the end of it all, they might be like, oh, oh, wow, I really need to pick up the book. I really need to okay. take the course, et cetera. Uh, I'll never forget this one. They're very helpful. I never forget this, the thing you said, and then you say at the very end of your speech, and that's the thing about sponsorships. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, right? uh, I don't know why I literally went back to the hotel room and added that slide right before my speech that yeah. I don't remember what conference it was, but, um, okay. Okay. While you were talking, this was very useful. I think I know what it is now. I think it's, um, I was trying to extrapolate, like, who could I give this speech to, like, in fast forward three years? Yeah, and I yeah. think it's just, like, um, any audience of people who has a creative project that they're working on. 
that they want to have a larger impact with. And this is this is the universal this is the universal challenge that I think a lot of people have. I think that maybe that's the initial question is, is like we all want to like have a bigger impact with our project, our creative vision, right? This I feel like that's maybe the best thing to open with. Yeah, and by the way, the, the, what I like about this is we're keeping it stupid simple because that's where it has to begin. This is not a groundbreaking insight. By the way, that first beat right. shouldn't be. It should right. just be like this is what you want, right? Yeah, um, it's a period of alignment, very brief. So like if you want to resonate with an audience, you start with alignment. So that's mm -hmm. what we're doing here. You have a creative project. You want to have an impact with it. Now you'll find ways to develop the opening moments, right? Which basically mm -hmm. amount to you saying that in not so many words. You'll have a little clever metaphor or a joke or an ex illustrative example. You'll find a way to do it or we'll work on that. But mm -hmm. the most important is that we get the plain language beat, which is you have a creative project. You want to have an impact with it. And that sets you up to do what you said your goal was, which is you mm -hmm. can speak to somebody dancing on TikTok. You can speak to a podcaster, a YouTuber who does educational videos, a YouTuber who does films. You could speak to someone like me who's like, I want to put out thought leadership and then partner with, you know, my latest partner, MailChimp. Like I would love more MailChimp programs, right? So that's broadening your audience without losing sight of the impact you're going to have on the audience. Mm -hmm. You're not diluting mm -hmm. the message. So I love that. Mm -hmm. The next thing seems to be the status quo is you have a lot of head junk around making that happen. And then you have to like, you have to like list some of the head junk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just mark that down as a placeholder, but you really quickly pivoted to like central to the head junk is how to make it financially viable. And I can see mm -hmm. you saying like, maybe you just want to fund it. So it's real, or right. maybe you actually want to earn a living right. through it or with it. Right. There's mm -hmm. different ways to think about the financial viability. Right. Um, so like really quickly, don't overthink it with the people you interact with or the people you want to reach. How are they typically going about like, what's the head junk? How are they trying to make it financially viable now? Just list out a bunch of examples. Um, they are trying to, uh, self fund it with savings for a YouTuber. The Holy grail is like getting monetized, getting ad sense. And it's, it's what I call indirect monetization. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's, it's a way in which you can actually make money for your project and not actually have to have a, a sales conversation with okay. anyone. So self fund it with savings, monetizing right. it. Like as with YouTube, um, I'm going to throw up maybe crowdsourcing it. Like you have an mm -hmm. audience yep. and it's like a Kickstarter esque right. Right. way, like right. little tiny donations, uh, digital panhandling, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, way. so there's, there's all the, there's all the way, I mean, there, there's a lot of ways there's affiliate revenue where you could put like links, you know, adjacent to the posts that you know people can click on, um, you know, merchandise, you know, whether it's like actual, you know, shirts, t-shirt mugs, or digital products, you know, uh, courses, uh, coaching, things like that. Um, uh, as you mentioned, patronage, um, membership products, uh, services um, is a big one, right? There's a lot of people right. you speak to. I'm probably one of them services, right? That's another big thing. So one, one other big, one other big thing is that there is a and maybe this comes at the end of the listing of the status quo, but like sponsorships is distasteful for a lot of people. They look at it as something that they either, either if they're currently doing it, it's like a thing that you just kind of have to do to keep the lights on. Virtually anyone who is in a sponsorship has had at least one experience where it was like not great with the sponsor. And so yep. they have this like impression that like, I just would prefer not to do that. So that's, that's a wonderful point. I think that comes later. I think it comes in, you're going to acknowledge it after you reveal that you believe in sponsorships. Okay. You're okay. You're going to frame it better because it's not just what's the big switch sponsorships. It's mm. what's the big switch. And this is going to be a crude approximation of your thinking. It's you see all the ways you're trying to make that financially viable. You're trying to do that in either indirect fashion, or you're like trying to do it solo. Like the rogue genius is a myth. The rogue successful thinker is a myth. You have to combine powers with others. Growing your audience is better when you collaborate. YouTubers mm -hmm. get this. Authors get this. They appear on mm -hmm. podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. better when you think about monetization too. I want you to take yeah. a partnership mentality to everything you do, right? Like that's a framing device. Mm -hmm. not saying it's the one you say that allows you to, to then enter into the sponsorship beats of the speech Got with it. less head trash in their way. Because they're like, oh, I know you're saying sponsorship, but the way you framed it up for me means it's a kind of sponsorship or an approach mm, to it. Partnership, you know? yeah. And then okay. you can acknowledge, if you want to, the objection. Got it, got it, okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna go back up real quick. Let's retrace the beats briefly. 
So you have a creative project. You want to have an impact with it. To do that, you know, you have a lot of head junk to sort through about making it happen. And maybe you this, maybe you that, maybe you that. I think central to that head junk for all of us is how do we even make this like financially viable? How do we fund it? Maybe you want to fund mm -hmm. it at cost. You just want it to exist. Maybe you want it to be a source of income. You want to earn a livelihood for yourself, maybe others. And here are some ways that you're probably doing that. You know, a lot of people self-fund it. It looks like that. You're monetizing on YouTube, AdSense, indirect monetization, crowdsourcing, patronage. You're selling physical products through it, like merch. You're selling digital products, like courses. You're selling services, which, by the way, pull you away from doing the thing. And now you're just doing the services. You're not actually making the thing happen. Like, you're able to start agitating some of the pain even before the dedicated section to do that. Here's the missing piece a lot of people make. They're just like, and this sucks, right? You know? Okay. Let's play doctor. All of the things I just mentioned to you are symptoms. You're the doctor. Diagnose the illness. Why are all those things what I turn to either first or exclusively? Um, yes, maybe before sponsorships seems viable or preferable or just in general. Like I'll give you an example is I agitate when I acknowledge the status quo of a content creator or a thought leader. I'm like, and what are you doing? I have a chaos rant to illuminate the status quo and the problems. And I'm like, you're posting on LinkedIn at 9 a.m. because Shopify released a, port, a report that said 9 a.m. was the best time. But now that that's out there, that's no longer the best time. But you don't have time to do anything different because you're also on Facebook, you're also on Instagram. Mm. I kind of, it, I approximate what I eventually reveal to you is you on the hamster wheel, right? And you're just trying to outshout everybody else who's stuck in this commodity cage. So what I'm trying to do is say, here are the symptoms, and it looks like you doing marketing, the illness is you're a commodity. That's the reason you're doing this exhausting work or shouting or getting aggressive. 99% do it wrong, right? Is because you're a commodity thinker. You don't have IP. That's what we need is that you have to have higher impact thoughts and ideas that you develop proactively. But to, that's my uh, diagnosis of the illness, right? But I start with the symptoms. So you have the symptoms, diagnose the illness. Why am I doing all these things? I'm not sure if this is the exact one, but I do think it's because you have no one to turn to to ask which is the right one. I, I just I, I, I hearken back to how lonely it was for us coming up as creators. We had no one that in our life, friends, family, no one we could ask and be like, hey, of the six monetization avenues that we could take to like take, you know, bring our creative project to life, which one do you think we should do? I don't know. I, that in in my in my head, I don't. I also want to put put this bug in your ear that um, I have one of the largest uh, media uh, company nonprofit media organizations in Northern California in my course right now. Mm. Their d director of digital content joined because they want to get sponsorships for their media organization. And so more, the more people that I start to work with it, it's like my mind starts stretching of like, how is this applicable to yeah. a company like that versus right. like a TikToker, you know? That's and great. so I as, useful. as I'm, as I'm like thinking about your question, like what is the, what is the answer for that, that director of digital right. content of like, why, why do they have the status quo? You yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I still want to figure this out because there's such power in saying you think the problem is this, but actually the problem is this, right? So like an example that's crude and rough and maybe not irrelevant to you, but try it on for size here. You think the problem is how to monetize it. And that causes you to do all these things that are solely dependent on you, right? So because you're doing this indirect and isolating approach to monetization. So that's actually the problem. It's not like, how do I monetize it? It's how do I shift from having a roguish mentality to a partnership mentality? Like, mm. again, that's not that's clunky, not that brilliant, right? Because it's coming from me, not you. But that's like what I'm going for is like, you think the problem is this, but actually, it's this that makes you a leader in their mind, uh, not just someone who's like got another checklist. Oh, that's 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 100 percent it, because it's like it, it, that can be applied to any type of person who has a creative project, whether you're a solo creator or a corporation is like you're making decisions in a vacuum. You, I could I could you know, seg by talking about all these examples. And if any of you have ever collaborated with everyone, anyone, you know, if you go on someone's show or you collaborate on YouTube or you, you know, hire a consultant for your company to ask what they think is the best pathway to make this decision, you know, that getting new data will help you make better decisions, right. you know, about, about, so it's something like that. And I can see you saying something like hearkening back to the goal. 
because the goal is creative excellence, funding this project, having an impact with it. Impact, it's like, right. You're not going to talk about monetization sponsorships yet. You're like, creative excellence is never achieved alone. Like, this is true of the projects we're trying to put out there. Look, comedians in the small comedy clubs swapping notes, podcasters, this, that, the other thing, authors, TikTokers, YouTubers, like – the excellence and success and traction, the impact of your projects is never achieved alone. And I am here to propose that the funding, the monetization, the ability to thrive financially is also never achieved alone. And there's this weird limiting belief where we kind of sort of embrace that the first is true. The project itself needs to be imbued with perspectives and other people's platforms and collaborations. And then all of a sudden we like drop that mentality when we're like, how do I make money on this thing? Right. Mm. I'm asking you to carry it forward. And the prime way to carry it forward. Oh, by the way, is sponsorship, right? Not Dude, that that's so brilliant. Like, that's how, that's brilliant. Yep. I love that. That's by the way, that is your thinking. I'm just trying to like put it in order. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. trying to synthesize and shave the clay that you just put on the table. So like, mm -hmm. let's say that was it. And let's finish off the dialogue outline. So like the problems with the status quo, we've sort of touched on it's spaghetti on the wall. You're doing it alone. Um, it's isolating. It's you're making decisions in a vacuum, etc. The big change, the premise is um, like monetization, I'll write it down in knee jerk fashion and you massage the right way to say mm -hmm. it, but like monetization should also be approached with this partnership, collaborative mindset, just placeholder, right? Yep. Like that's, that's the big shift for people. Right. Yep. Behind that, they're asking, what do you mean to fund the project? I should take that collaborative or partnership approach. Do you have like a signature story of someone who tried the in a vacuum approach and then made the switch? Is there do you have someone that can retrace essentially the beats of the story match the beats of the talk so far? I believe I do. Um, his name is Paul Jameson. He's a podcaster who teaches lawn care professionals how to grow their business. Awesome. And um, he started out as a he had a lawn care business and he was, you know, mowing lawns and doing all this um, and uh, decided to start a podcast talking about how he was growing his business, you know, in terms of how do you get more customers on a single street and how do you maximize, you know, uh, like labor cost, you know, how, how do you, um, you know, optimize labor costs and all, all this stuff. Right. Um, and um, so there's definitely a lot in that story that I think mirrors yeah. Um, so now you just need to hit the beats like, yeah. there, and there's like a, you want, you don't, you don't necessarily want the audience to see the seams of this, but when you develop right. that story, you're just retracing the beats that you had lined up in the talk so far. And by the way, what I'm really excited for is when you, these are the, this is the skeleton. When you put meat on the bones of each of these yeah. section, you shine, you get clever, you have metaphors, you have jokes, you have all this stuff, right? This is not yeah. just bland copy like we're putting it down it's just we're getting the beats so yeah. with the story let's do the same thing so uh, let me show you what this looks like folks in the crowd mm -hmm. this is paul jameson he's a lawn care expert he had a lawn care business he was selling services he wanted to start a podcast he wanted to have an impact with that podcast then what i need is the next beat is show me how he collaborated or took a partnership mentality to strengthening the project side of it mm -hmm. he saw value in talking to guests as yes. a podcaster. He saw value in guesting on other shows to grow his yep. own as a yep. podcaster. He saw, uh, yes, totally. You know, all, so got it. Got it. Beats, okay. Right? Got it. Got it. Got it. So, so the collaborative thing. Yes. Examples of collaborative thinking. Ooh, that's right. Yep. Um, yep. I love that phrase of collaborative thinking mm -hmm. to strengthen his creative ideas or the podcast directly. Right. And I agree. Yep. We're so good at that. Usually we're like, mm -hmm. I got to work out this material. Like yep. people send their drafts of books around people like, you know, like a, the comedian example comes back. Yep. We're like, does this make sense? Friend, right. you're a comedian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like we do that all the time to strengthen our ideas. We do it all the time to strengthen the projects themselves. Then we like drop that mentality <laughs> when it comes to monetization and it's bananas. It makes no mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. once you illuminate that, they go, how could I see it any other way? Right. So he went through the same thing, his ideas, and his podcast directly got better. And then what you want to show is, all right, beats here. It all fell apart when he dropped that mentality to try and monetize it. Mm -hmm. And you have to show that. And yeah. at the end, what I want to know is like, uh, was there one moment 
or a series of moments where he finally took a collaborative, what did you call it? Collaborative, Think, collaborative thinking. thinking. Yeah, where he finally took collaborative thinking to the monetization aspects. Mm-hmm. Like what made him made this make the switch? What happened after? What like one to three insights can we learn from that? For him, it was like the switch from getting annoyed that the brands were not offering him money to uh, realizing that it was actually his job to educate them on uh, how he could be a, a partner for them and why they should compensate him. Um, and that process took a lot of effort that there wasn't an obvious return. That wasn't obvious there was going to be a return initially. And that's like part of the genius of the story is it opens people up to a new possibility, clears away existing head trash, and behind it, your IP can come in. I have another beat that we need to add to this. I don't know where it goes, but like a big, big myth is that um, everyone takes a very narcissistic approach to funding their projects. They think this project is so brilliant. How can I go out there and find someone who cares as much about it as me? And that's virtually impossible. Yes. And so um, what I teach people is that you don't lead with that. You lead with how you can help them, this partner, accomplish their business outcome. And in turn, you will also be able to accomplish your business outcome or your creative outcome. Um, And so it's like um, a positioning exercise. This is like the the central to what what I teach in the book. I love that. I love that. So like... If that's part of the methodology section to come in the speech, then in the story of Paul, you're like, so we can learn three distinct things from Paul, right? The first is that it is really difficult to care so much like we do as creatives about your project and not have any potential partners see it that way. But Paul's central switch was he went from saying this that his show is for to pitching them like this because he became an educator, not just of his audience, but of his partners, because they'll never mm-hmm. care about the, you. They'll care about themselves. Right. And you have to mm-hmm. you have to align with their goals. Right. Meet them where they're right. at. I'm not going to belabor because I know you have this in abundance. The next piece of it, which is so how do I do that? That's yeah. where you shine. You have method, okay. you have visuals, you have supporting examples. That's the easy part, I think, for you. I think mm-hmm. the hardest part there is runtime. You're going to have to really condense yeah. it down. Right. Um, Just to recap, I think seeing them all play out quickly matters. So like you have a creative project, you want to have an impact with it. You have lots of head junk around that. And mainly it's about how to make it financially viable. How do I fund it? Or how do I even make money through it? So you're doing all these things. Maybe you're self-funding it with savings. You're monetizing your YouTube like AdSense or all these other indirect monetization examples. You're crowdsourcing it. Maybe you have a patronage model. You're selling physical products like merch. You're selling digital products like, like courses. You're selling services. And a lot of this stuff isn't quite it. And it's also pulling you away from, from it, from having an impact. So you're actually getting further from the impact that you wanted, not closer. Um, you're taking a spaghetti on the wall approach. It's also very isolating and lonely. But the problem isn't any one of these things or even selecting the right thing. The problem is that you were making a decision in a vacuum instead of with a partnership mindset. In other words, creative excellence never happens in a vacuum. It never happens alone. And this is true of the idea itself, of the project itself, And the piece that's missing of the monetization of that project. All three things need a collaborative mindset. You need collaborative thinking. We know this on the ideas. We swap ideas with friends all the time. Here, 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 here. We know this on the project. We collaborate on projects all the time to grow the audience and strengthen the project. Here, 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 here. And then we go to monetization and we're alone trying to do it solo, right? I am here to tell you that the most important shift to the creators that thrive today, to the thinkers that thrive today, is they take a collaborative mindset beyond just the project to apply that to their monetization strategy. There's a shorthand we have for that. It's called sponsorships, but a specific kind, right? Let me show you how this works. This is Paul. Tell the story of Paul, right? Mm -hmm. And here's how to act like Paul. You do the methodology. So it's not there, right? But like, I think we have the beats of it that are necessary Mm -hmm. for you to like make the case from the stage. Dude, this is such, I cannot wait for this, dude, because I, I, uh, first of all, you're so good at this, uh, because last anecdote, which I think is actually interesting, which is that I kind of did the whole, my, my initial webinar to try to convert people to like join my course or do coaching or whatever was like, here's my entire methodology steps one through eight. I'm going to belabor the, I'm going to go through the, the whole thing. And like a lot of people 
Um, I just came into it assuming like, yeah, you, you love sponsorships, right? Like, like, of course, everyone loves sponsorships, right? And I did not do much like of the stuff we just talked about where it's just like, okay, let's, let's meet them where they are. Um, and this has been one of my central challenges, honestly, of like speaking to a broader audience because I'm so fixated on only speaking to the people who care about sponsorships today. So this was so useful because I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic that designing more collateral speaking collateral like this will have a larger impact for me. Like this is very meta, right? But like here I'm, I'm thinking of you, I, this takes some explaining, so bear with me. You're not the sponsorship guy. You're the collaborative thinking guy in a way. So here, here's what I mean by that. There's there's a software company called Wistia. They do video marketing software, mm-hmm. right? Early on, they would market their message and their mission, not their product. They want to make business more human, right? The CEO, Chris Savage, would admit, and we solve 5% of that problem. We want to make business more human. We're video software. We solve 5% of it relating to video. But we can go and collaborate, something you love, with Buffer, right? With a social media marketing tool who also approaches the work to make business more human. And then we can do something collaborative to grow our joint cause because we see the world the same way. It's the same for you. It's like you are, you want creators, creatives, thinkers, media companies who, yeah, eventually you want to show them why sponsorships matter, but more to the point, you want them to take this collaborative thinking that has served them so well when they think about the creativity aspect and apply that to the business and the financial aspect, to the revenue aspect, right? And oh, by the way, you solve X percent of that because your specialty is sponsorships. But I guarantee you, there's other ways to take a collaborative approach to monetization and to your business, right? And there might be a specialist out there for that. They're now a co-marketing partner of yours. They're now a good Mm -hmm. collaborator of yours. So I don't want you to only get picked for the stage or the podcast because you're the sponsorship guy, because that's the person that they scroll past in the feed if they don't care about sponsorships Mm -hmm. right now, which you're saying a lot of people don't yet. Or you get planted on the one of 10 speaking at 12 o'clock, right? And you get get relevant people, don't get me wrong. That's why having the keynote, it's, it's easy to bundle it with. Now I'm going to take you into the methodology I showed you really in depth. That's the breakout, right? Mm. So that's maybe the webinar that you have where you're yeah. like, you already care about sponsorships. Now you're ready for the digital webinar. Now you're ready for the in-person breakout that I will deliver. But you're able to lead them there where it's like, oh, inescapably, I'd want that now. That's so uh... – yeah. And oh, man, this is gonna be so good because if I do the keynote and then in the breakout, what I ultimately realized was that my webinar should not go across all eight steps. My new webinar is I just focus on step one, which is pitching. And then I go really, really in depth on pitching in the breakout. And people are like, OK, this is great. You've convinced me now. What now? And I'm like, OK, take the course or hire us for coaching. Take it a step further back. They're not yet in your market. They're close to being in your market, meaning they care about sponsorships. Right. They're like on the periphery. This is akin to somebody who who really wants to be a good storyteller or Mm. wants to differentiate their message or business. Um, Those people are somewhat in my market, but not fully because I need Mm. them to care about my version of this, which is premise development, IP development, and the speaking and podcasting and evangelists that make you a thought leader behind it. Late in the speech, I say, oh, by the way, like this is the central shift we're making. Don't create content, create IP. Here's the thought leaders IP pyramid. Here are the layers. The first and most foundational is the premise. We're going to talk about premise development for a little bit. Here's an example. Here's a methodology, et cetera. Right? And I build the whole pyramid at the end of it, but I'm not going in depth to all the layers. I'm just going mm. a little in depth. So I think that's what you're saying. It's like the yeah, first yeah. thing I need is what are the prompts or what's the heuristic or framework to make me a collaborative thinker for the monetization element? Right? It's like, I don't know what it is. It's like the first thing is you have to learn to pitch your idea through their goals, right? Yes, exactly. That That's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. And you, wait, I know right. you work. So it's not that hard. Yeah. Like, and you're like, okay, you do this as a podcast guest. You pitch, mm-hmm. you know, what's a bad pitch? I'm awesome. Feature me. What's a good pitch? Justin, I know your show seeks to do this. I haven't seen you feature somebody like this, but I think it's very relevant to that mission of your show. Here's why my story maps to that, right? You start with them. Now switch switch to monetization. Here's how you do that, right? So re- just keep in mind the central mm-hmm, switch of the, the parallel is okay, not okay. go do sponsorships. Right. The central switch is I can take the same collaborative thinking that has served me well creatively and do it in the like monetization realm, mm-hmm. right? So you got to give me mm-hmm. those tools, which by the way might lead you to pitch, right? That's the first yeah. thing. Right. Right. Man, so, it's so good. A little higher up on the buyer's journey. 
Okay, I want to give you a compliment because this is giving me a bunch of ideas for just like content, like YouTube, I, oh, YouTube yes. videos I could I could film because like yes. I've been this has been a big block for me is like I don't I really struggle knowing. Uh, I didn't want to be that guy and like, here's 10 ways to make $10,000 a month as a creator. And like one of them is sponsorships or something, yeah, but right. like this feels like a much broader canvas to speak to this whole issue around collaborative thinking and why there's a yeah. block for people to transition. So right. thank you. Thank you very much. You're this welcome. is, I'm By excited. Way, I'm excited like for this. You. Yeah. I'm so excited for your speech. I am almost more excited for just using this dialogue outline and the speech as Again, IP assessment, like what are all the pieces do you have them? And then ideas that you can go and develop. You know, it's funny. Uh, I promised that the final bookend, I I, when I finished writing this book, I was like, I'm never writing another book. And I was just thinking, I just thought I was like, I should write, I sh this should be my second book. 